Um, <laughs> and so a few weeks ago, Mark pulled me in for my one-on-one -on -one that I have with him every week. And he said, oh, Claire, would you think about teaching on the summer series? And I thought, OK, yeah, no, I will. Oh, yes, Mark, yes, I will. <laughs> um, and, and literally within a few hours, the, the chapter of John came to my mind. And I thought, oh, this is quite classic for the Compassion and Justice Pastor to speak on John 4, but I've learned to listen to the Lord and be obedient. And so that is what we're going to get stuck into here this morning. And last week, it really encouraged me because some guy in the 1130 service stood up and said, I've had this word of the Lord, that the Lord wants to bring a fresh revelation of the compassion of Jesus in our midst. And I thought, okay, Jesus, you're on, I'm on track, I'm on track. So I want to invite us to stand because this is a really familiar passage and I'm not here just to run the motions with us this morning, but I believe the Lord wants to bring fresh revelation in this house around his compassion. So let's just pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are present with us in this room. And we thank you that you're in the business of encountering us. And I want to ask right now for the spirit of revelation to flood our minds and our hearts in this room this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, that this word, your living word, would sharpen us, would convict us, would encourage us, and would transform our hearts like that double-edged sword that the word has described as. We want to know you, Jesus. And we want to walk out of here differently. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, if you have your Bible with you, you can open it to John chapter 4. Um, I have it printed on here just for the ease of navigating a Bible and an iPad and the cup and all that good stuff. Um, and we're just going to get stuck in, and we are literally going to journey through John chapter 4. Not the whole thing. There's not three points. It's about 100, but you know, you'll be okay. Um, but we're just going to just journey through this passage together and just see what the Spirit might want to say to us this morning. John chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now, quick geography lesson for you. Galilee is like down here, and Judea is up here. And in between is this big portion of land called Samaria. And many of you who will have heard this, many will have heard this before, but the Jews and Samaritans didn't get along, right? We know this. But I think we flippantly say that. We don't always know the strength of their not getting along. They literally, it was like pure hatred almost for one another. And so Jews naturally would go around the long way to avoid going through Samaria. And I don't know about you, and, but maybe it's just me. I mean... I definitely have places that I would like to avoid going through, right? When everyone else is going this way, Jesus went through. And we need to ask ourselves why. And then it says he came to this town in Samaria. And what happens then? It says that Jesus was tired as he was from the journey. And so he sat down by the well. And it was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. I love this. Jesus got tired, guys. He got tired. But what did he do? He sat down. Unlike us. We like to just plow on and go faster. Jesus sat down because he was fully man. And let's not forget this, right? I think we often read these stories and think, well, Jesus was a super, like superhuman. He wasn't actually like me, but he experienced all of the emotions and all the physical things that you and I experience in this moment. He got tired. But then what does it say? It says this woman is showing up at the well at what time? At noon. And I love this about the Bible, these tiny details. We've not even gotten into the story. And suddenly we're already learning something about what's going on. 
He has me such curiosity for the word of God to ask questions of these. There's not one sentence in the Bible that's wasted. We often skip through those early verses, like, oh, come on, get to the real stuff. But these are curious things that we need to ask questions about. So what does that tiny detail of noon tell us? What do we know about this woman? Why is she coming to this well at noon? Nobody goes to a well in the heat of the day. I know it's a foreign concept for us in England because we don't experience the heat. But in the Middle East, you do not go to the well and lift a heavy jar and walk miles to get water in the heat in the middle of the day. Women of that time would go in groups in the morning or late at night in the cool of the day. This woman is by herself in the heat of the day. And what we start to realize is that she's not able to be in her community. There's something about her that has shunned her, that has shamed her, that has pushed her out of the cultural norms of the time. She was hiding. Noon, she was hiding. And we all hide too, right? Mark reminded us just the last week or the week before, where are you? But I think it's more even more subtle than that, because you know how it goes. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. How are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm great. I'm great. How are you? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. British culture almost idolizes hiding that stiff upper lip. The culture that we live in, we need to recognize where it doesn't add up with the Jesus that, of the Bible that we are reading about. And what we see in this woman is that there was some kind of brokenness that she's experienced because we see the results of the brokenness, right? Just like at the beginning of time with Adam and Eve, where there was shame that entered because of the action that they took and the guilt, and then they started to blame, and they started to hide and clothe themselves to hide themselves from God and each other. And the shame leads to that fear brewing in us and anxiety starts to well up and and we start to race and get busier and busier because hiding looks like busyness. But the good news is, if you feel like that this morning, you're in the right place to encounter the one who's ready to meet with you. Just as Jesus had to go to Samaria, God shows up here in this room to meet with us as we come. But what I love most is that in this place of where her shame has obviously piled on, and we don't know why, actually, because often the assumption is that she's just super immoral. But we don't know in that culture whether, um, as we discover later in the story, whether her life has unfolded out of her own choice or the choices of others, because it says that she's been married five times and she's now with a man who's not married. And actually, in that culture, if she couldn't bear children, she would have been divorced and cast aside. We don't actually know how this came about, that her shame has piled on, but this woman is full of shame, and Jesus sees her shame as an opportunity for a conversation. And I love how this conversation begins. Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? Makes sense, right? He meets her right where she's at, and it's so Jesus to take the thing that's very in front of us, the realness of the life that we're living, and to ask a simple question. In fact, if you look at the Gospels, what you discover is this. I loved finding this out. Jesus gets asked 184 questions in the four Gospels. He only directly answers three. How annoying is that? But guess how many questions he asked? 307. Intriguing, right? Maybe some of us in the room this morning, you're asking God a question and you're not getting the answer. And you know what? You're frustrated. And you're like, why are you not answering me? Have you gone silent? Are you not interested in me? Perhaps he's more interested in the journey that's going to lead you to receiving the revelation of the truth of understanding in a back and forth conversation instead of just piling on the truth directly so you don't actually understand it in here. But it got interesting to me to think about this because I think about the times when I look to share my faith. And I'll think about a scenario that I'm walking into and think, okay, Jesus, please help me today. This is an opportunity. And I'll play it out in my head. And I think, well, this person might ask this question. And this person, oh, if they ask that question, I don't know how I'm going to answer that question. 
And before I know it, I'm like backtracking out of the conversation, thinking, you know what, I- I'm scared I'm not going to be able to defend you, Jesus, because it's like I need to defend him. No, I do not. Um, but I think Jesus shows us here that he's less worried about the outcome, controlling the outcome, and he, he demonstrates obedience in just starting a conversation. And sometimes I think that I'm also resistant to his interruptions, to asking those simple questions, even of him. You know, a f- several months ago, I was, I'd, come, I'd been to work and like every good mum does, you haven't got dinner ready, so you're jumping into Aldi on the way home thinking, oh my gosh, I've got all these people to feed, what am I going to feed them? And um, so I'm jumping out of the car, and I go get the, my trolley, and, um, and I can hear this kind of conversation going on, and there's a homeless guy that sits outside of our Aldi. And I grab my trolley, and I turn around, and, and I can feel this tug, and I'm like, oh, I should probably... And I said, you, would you like me to get you something to eat? He said, no, I don't actually need anything to eat. Okay, okay, great. Well, I, I don't have any money. And I just plow on into Aldi. And I go around Aldi, and, and the whole time I'm feeling uneasy about this, something about it, it's not sitting right in my stomach. And I come out of Aldi, and I can still see there's another lady talking to him. And I go to my car, and I unpack the groceries like you do. And I sit in my driver's seat, and I go to take my, my bag off and put it on the seat next to me. And I kid you not, I look on the seat next to me, and there is a 20-pound note sat on the seat. I don't know where the 20-pound note came from. I didn't know I had 20-pound note. And then immediately, I was sharpened. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, Claire, get out of that car and go take that 20-pound note to that guy that you told you had no money. And, and so I got out of my car, and I walked back to him, and, and I <laughs> sheepishly was like, you know what, I do have some money, and um, I'm so sorry, but you know, I felt like I'm supposed to give this to you, and I had this conversation, and he said to me, thank you so much for talking to me. He said, I actually needed 20 pounds to be able to sleep tonight in the shelter. I didn't need food. I just needed somebody to ask me what I actually needed, to have a conversation, a simple question. And you know what, I could have in this moment gone, you know what, the wisdom of our world says not to give a homeless guy money, right? And there's truth in that. But I think I meant what God caught my attention this moment for was how easily I assume instead of asking Jesus what I'm supposed to do in a moment. And I learned in this moment how sneakily The sin of indifference had entered my life and was rampantly outworking in my busyness. As your compassion, justice, missions pastor. (laughs) Happens to the best of us, guys. But it sharpened me to go, you know what? The guy who knew the answer to every question and how everything would work out was the guy who simply asked questions. Why? Why? Because he's interested in relationship, and he still is. Jesus, in that moment, was interested in his relationship with me and teaching me and forming me, and he was also interested in me having relationship with his image in that homeless guy outside Aldi, because that is both Jesus. And if we want to be more like Jesus, I want to suggest to us that we need to get better at asking questions. Asking Jesus every time you walk past a homeless person, what is my part to play? And trusting he will say no to you when it's not your moment, and he will say yes to you when it is your moment, and he will show you what it is that you need to do. But how interruptible are we, verse 8? In another moment, I had several years ago... You'd thought I'd have learned this lesson by now, but several years ago, I was in Harpenden, and I'd taken my son Cohen to a party. Um, I think it was around, uh, kind of, I think it was a light party, actually, um, because he'd come out with this massive bag of sweets. And, um, and this is my son who, at three or four years old, when he was asked in primary school what he wanted to do when he grew up, he said, I want to design homes for homeless people. I want to draw them and create them and build them. And so I knew this about him, but we came out of this party and um, 
And he got this massive bag of sweets, and it was late. And I was like, I just want to get home. I'm tired. I've been around too many kids for too long, and I'm exhausted. And um, we're walking down the Harpen and High Street, and, and he tugs on my shirt. And he's like, Mum, Mum, see that guy over there? And I'm like, yeah, I see that guy. <laughs> okay, it's time to get home. Let's go, let's go, let's get in the car. And he said, Mum, Mum, can I please go and give him some of my sweets? And I said, no, he's not going to want your sweets, son. Come on, it's time to go home. Let's get into bed. And, he, and we start walking again. And he tugs my shirt and again. He says, Mum, please can I go and give him some of my sweets? I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, we can go. He's not going to want any, but we'll, we'll go. So we walk up to this guy, and Cohen literally just says, would you like some of my sweets? And the guy was like, you don't have to give me my, your sweets. That's so sweet of you, but... And I was like, no, I'd really like to give you some of my sweets. And then, to my horror, <laughs> this guy had this really large tumor on his neck. And Cohen goes, what's that? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and he goes, oh, you know, I, I, it's just, I've got this thing growing on my neck. And, and Cohen goes, does it hurt? I'm like, can we stop with the questions? <laughs> And the guy said, no, it, it really does hurt. And this guy is starting to well up. And, and then Cohen goes, my mum will pray for you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> take the wheel. And so I am like, right. <laughs> so we, 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 we crouch down and we're talking to him. And the irony of this is that all of these people are piling out of this party who I'd been in a conversation with previously, who'd been complaining about the number of homeless people on the street in Harpenden and how uncomfortable it made them. And I'm thinking, oh, now they're going to watch me kneeling down with this guy and praying for him. And they're going to be like, oh, well, I guess she's encouraging them to be. You know, there was this whole scenario going, maybe that's just me, but that, this is the real, real Claire. Um, so we, bat, we just bent down and I just said, you know what, Jesus? Would you come? Would you heal this guy? Would you let him know how much he's loved? We have this massacre, and the guy just starts to sob. And it all started with this young boy saying, would you like some of my sweets? And if I'm honest, I just think we need more of Jesus and his presence to shape us, to die to ourselves and our right to securing our reputation, our right to the use of our times, to the self-appointed confinements of what we're okay doing for Jesus. Galatians 5, 24 to 25 says that those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires to look good, to feel good, to be in charge of everything. And if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And in these scenarios, in front of us was just a person made in the image of God who didn't look like me, who didn't have the same life as me, but deserved an, a conversation and someone to look them in the eye and to ask them a simple question, because every one of us deserves relationship. And so this conversation in John continues, and we, we read in verse 9 that the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God who it is, and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you are nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it, from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water. What a scripture. What truth. And it's familiar truth, but it got me thinking. <laughs> that sentence in verse 16 got me thinking. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water, to draw water. And I thought about the reality of our lives. And how that spoke to the tiredness that I think I see in many of us. 
You know, we come, we might encounter Jesus when we first get to know him and we have this moment and we feel like, feel that if you met someone who's just, just met Jesus for the first time, they are buzzing, right? They can't wait to tell everybody around them about Jesus that they've just met. And it's like the cup gets filled up and they're like, I want to tell you, and I want to tell you, and I want to tell you. And we know this truth, right? We know that what fills our cup is what comes out of our cup. And so we, as Christians, we come to church, we fill up our cup, and then we go out to work and we pour it out. And we fill up our cup in our quiet time in the morning and we, we pour it out again, and, and we fill it up and we love our kids and they don't love us back, and then we fill it up and we, you know, you get the idea, right? We fill this cup, we have this motion that this is how the Christian life goes. And there's something that's snuck in that's told us that the longer we've been a Christian, we should be able to do this faster and in more directions, and, and it seems like the speed at which we're filling up is less than the speed that we're pouring out. And sometimes we're pouring out so much in one direction that we're so tired. And then someone loves us back, and that feels quite good. And so, oh, if I just pour out again, then we'll just fill that up again. And sometimes we get so tired that the only thing we have energy for is maybe a session of Netflix and, you know, that large G&T and whatever it might be. And it pours in, and we get to the point where... It's just a whole lot of effort to get that cup back into the position to fill with living water. It's tiring to do this, right? And it got me thinking that maybe we got it all wrong. Maybe Jesus is talking about our cup, our life, being a cup in this posture constantly. Where we're not doing this that he's filling us with himself. Like if we place this cup under a tap or a waterfall and the constancy of the water going in meant that it wells up like a spring of water and it just overflows. And perhaps what we're supposed to do is put our cup into the hand of the Father and let him take our cup wherever it's meant to be. And whatever is in here and it's flowing in overflows. And suddenly we realize it's not about this action and busyness, but in this analogy, the tension of the being and the doing come together. What would it look like for you to assess your calendar, your time, your energy, your gifts, and maintain this posture Where might the Holy Spirit be asking you to rearrange, shift, change your posture to stay in this place where your cup can receive of Jesus and it overflows rather than this constant rushing that we seem to be in the process of? Because what fills your cup is what you will offer to the world around you. And so I love this dialogue that keeps going here through John. You have listening, you have questions, you have pursuit, and it's so relational. And Jesus is like slowly opening the Samaritan woman's heart. And what's coming out is this fear of the people around her, of the conflict that she's been involved in, of the shame of her past. And it's like Jesus knows that as he slowly opens her heart, She might get to know him and the reality of his love and that that is not dependent on her good behavior and maybe that will bring transformation. And this conversation continues. It goes back and forth and she's learning about Jesus and she's inviting him slowly to open her up. And what I love is that he doesn't stop at this point of saying, this is the truth. The living water is what you need. You don't need that water. Because what does he do then? In verse 16, he says, go call your husband and come back. And she says, well, about that, I have no husband. She replied, and Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands and the man you have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. He's honoring her vulnerability. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
Woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has, has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and truth. And he's, and he's having this conversation, essentially, she's like, what do I have to do to make this right? What do I need to outwork here? And Jesus is blowing her mind by saying, no, you don't have to do anything. But he's, he's confronting this religiosity in her, that you go to worship in a certain place, and that fixes it. And he said, no, I am it. And he wants every part of her life. And he's saying, I want you to go get that thing that you've been hiding behind and bring it to me here at this moment. And the conversation progresses and she goes off about the difference between Jews and Samaritans and Jesus says a time has come and is already coming and the woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus responds with this crescendo moment, mic drop, and he says, then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He's like, I'm it. I'm here for every longing of yours to be loved, to be accepted, to a significance, because none of those things, by the way, are wrong, right? In fact, God created you to have those longings. The problem only comes when we attempt to satisfy them in every other way than through Jesus. And then the disciples returned in verse 27 and were surprised to find him talking with this woman. Shocker. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? I love this. She encountered Jesus and the attachment to her water jar dropped and transformation has begun, and she goes back to the very people that had shamed her and ostracized her, and she starts a conversation with them to tell them about this Jesus that she's encountered. And in verse 39, it says that many Samaritans believed because of this woman's testimony. And what I want us to see here is there's so much in this story, it's so rich, and it gives us so many incredible examples of how to model our life on Jesus. And yet the thing that I felt the Lord speaking to me was this. We are all that woman at Samaria. It's easy to look at this story and not see yourself in her. Because she had five husbands and that's not my life. but we're all still wrestling with the sin that so easily entangles us. And the only way to receive the fullness of the abundance of living water that will satisfy is when we recognize this incredible, abundant, outrageous generosity of Jesus, compassion that shows up not just for our salvation, but for every moment of our journey in the here and the now. And verso, I think the Lord is saying to us afresh in this season, if only you knew the God, the gift of God that is available to you. If only we fully knew, and we can't fully know, but are we growing in that knowing? There's something that he wants to activate in us, but it starts with you and I experiencing the compassion of Jesus every single day that crosses our boundaries, that was interruptible into our life, that's not limited by or hindered by anything that we have done or like to put up in our hiddenness. And as we long for people to encounter Jesus in our community, it starts with you and I encountering this deep compassion of Jesus in every moment of our day. Because what pours in and the way that we interact with Jesus is what we will pour out to the brokenness of the world around us. And I will end here. This nothing hit me more greatly than this. I learned this lesson. I was just, as I was kind of reading the story, this moment came back to me. Um, back in 2021, 
um, coming out of the pandemic, I um, signed up to volunteer with Azalea. And I thought, oh my goodness, I am so not equipped to do this. But I went through Azalea's training um, and, and I can remember my very first time into Azalea. I had got in my car in Harpenden, all ready for this, like, you know, like, this is it, I'm going to serve, I'm going to serve. <laughs> Super excited. Um, and I remember driving through the streets, getting to Luton, parking my car, and getting out, and, and suddenly a bit of an uneasiness started. I thought, oh, this feels a bit uncomfortable. I'm not sure, oh, I don't really like this. Oh, this makes me feel a bit weird. And I start walking down the high street and walking through the main street of Luton, and, and there's all these guys standing around. They're just staring at me, and I'm sticking out like a sore thumb, clearly not from the street of Luton. Um, and I started to get really, really uncomfortable. And, um, and I thought, Jesus, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. I should just go back to the car and go home because what have I got to offer these women in Luton? And, um, and then I felt that Jesus just said, let's talk about it. Let's talk about your uncomfortableness. Let's talk about what your, your perceived ideas of what's going on here. And I had this kind of encounter with Jesus and I'm walking down this high street in Luton. And, um, and then I get into Azalea, it's a drop-in and the first lady walks in the door of the session and she walks in and she is in a frenzy and stressed and, and she's utterly battered and bruised and she's got blood pouring down one eye and, and she's actually um, wet herself out of the fear she'd just essentially been beaten up. And I stood there and thought, Phew. and the only thing I could think to do was say, well, can I get you some dry clothes? We got her some clothes and we took her to the shower and, and then she came and sat at the bar and I poured her a hot coffee and I will never forget this to the day I die. She looked at me and she said, why are you here? Why would you do this for us? I'm so stupid is what she said. I said, you're not stupid. And I looked at her and I said this. Because I've got someone that shows up and walks in my brokenness. It happened just now on the street outside in the midst of my sin. I didn't actually say sin to her. <laughs> but essentially, Jesus is walking every day with me in the midst of my brokenness, my messed up understanding of the world that I live in. And he crosses my sin boundaries and he says, I'm here for a conversation. Will you talk with me? I've got water for you. Would you stand? Would you stand?